All right, so we're starting again. This is our communications and storytelling panel. As you can tell, our theme is, you know, if you can do a great app and you can do a great project, but if you can't tell the story about it, it's gonna stay just a great app. But for winning and successful ones, you really have to really make that connection and tell a story. And so we have our three panelists. Do you, are you gonna pass the? All right, so go for it. We're gonna have them introduce each other and we're hoping to leave more time for question and answer um, after this. Shall I? Start with that. Then I'm uh, I'm looking at Elizabeth for the for the presentation to be uh, turned on. Uh, good morning. Um, I'm going to talk to you about the value of the data. And uh, just in case you're all wondering, like, what does she have on her chin? What what happened to her? Well, actually, if you um, uh, if you look at this picture, that was me last Tuesday, the, the one with the red pens on. Uh, and I fell skiing. I was skiing in Europe. Awesome, by the way. It was lovely weather, as you can see. But then this happened. Okay, well, now you know why that is. We got that elephant out of the room, right? So, um, so let me introduce myself. I'm, uh, I'm Maaike. Uh, I'm from the Netherlands, from Amsterdam, uh, and I'm a strategy designer. And I uh, design strategies for the company Business Models Inc. That's our company. And so what we do, we design a better business. Uh, we help startups to design a better business. But not only startups, also large international organizations. Uh, and the way how we do that, we use this book, Business Model Generation. Anyone familiar with that book? Yes, a few, good. Well, it's our book, we produced that book. Yeah, so, uh, so we're the producer of that. And uh, we sold already uh, 1 million copies worldwide in uh, over 30 languages. So um, definitely something to, uh, to get connected to. And I'll tell you a little bit about that. Because uh, what we see every day in practice is we see uh, people like yourself, startups, but also in large organizations, they come up with a new idea. And they're all saying like, yes, I'm gonna be rich with that, right? This is awesome, everybody will need that. However, what we see in reality, it's not, right? Huh? Because what we see in the data on its own, that's not enough. And we can write business plans, but maybe actually that's the best news of today. Stop writing business plans. It's a waste of your time. No business plan will survive the first customer contact, right? Remember that, so don't spend your time on doing that. Uh, we need to get out of thought lens, and we need to stop the blah, blah. Huh? So what is it that we need to, uh, to do, right? Because the big questions are, uh, if we really want to grow ourselves, if we really want to grow our business, where is the value being created? Huh? Where is the value? Where is the value for the business, right? but also the value for our customers, for our clients. And in order to do that, to grasp that, we need some new tools. Yeah, because we said stop writing business plans. Yeah, but how can we define that value that's out there? Yeah, so we need new tools, new skills, and a new mindset. And that's the business model canvas. That's basically the heart of that book, Business Model Generation, what we just showed. And that business model canvas will give you all a common language to discuss your business to have the right strategic conversations with your customers, with investors, with coworkers, eh, with everyone that's working together with you to help you to grow your business. And what that business model canvas is about, it's nine building blocks. And I can explain it to you just in two minutes. So that's how easy as it is. So who are your customer segments? Pretty important, who is my customer? What is the value proposition? What is the value that I'm really offering to my customers? And how does my product reach my customer? Through which channels? Where do I promote it? Where do I put it? How do I reach my customers? And once I've done a transaction, how do I keep my customers? What about the customer relationships? And where's the money? What is the revenue coming in from, from those transactions? How does that work? That side of the business model canvas is all about the value creation. Uh, the value creation for your customer, but also the value creation for the, for the business. The other side of the business model is about the internal organization. What kind of resources do you need? Uh, the people in your team, uh, being mentioned earlier this morning as well, very important. Who are your key resources? What are the things you do, your key activities? And also today, you don't need to do things on your own. Uh, 
who do you work with? Who are your key partners? Who really will help you to grow your business and to create more value? And what are the costs? Well, that's pretty simple, right? Those are the nine building blocks of the business model canvas. Let's have a look at an example. OneTap, a company from Australia. Meet Scott. Scott is the founder of OneTap. Uh, and Scott said, well, I have a brilliant idea. And I'm going to be rich. I'm going to earn at least $1 million, right? At least. I'm going to create an app. I'm going to create an app that people can use when they go to a bar. Uh, so that it's an easy mobile payment to settle your, your bill at the bar. Uh, that's pretty convenient. So what their business model looked like is they said, well, my customers are the drinkers. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to create a real cool app uh, to buy drinks. And people will, are, will be willing to pay a download fee for the app. And that's how I will be rich. But in reality, that didn't happen, right? She's like, hmm, maybe I missed something. Who is really my customer? Uh, who is really my customer? And what is the problem that I'm trying to solve? Uh, so there it gets back to what is the problem behind it, actually. So they got out of the building. It's really the only way to discover your problem is get out of the building. You won't find it behind your computer. And that's another big lesson learned. And so they got out of the building and indeed they identified the drinkers, they love the app. They are their customer. But they also learned more. They saw that the people serving the drinks also really liked it. They could also become their customer. Because right now, in all that credit card taking, doing the payments was a lot of hassle. It took a lot of time, and uh, credit cards were being blocked, and just a big mess. So they're like, you know, let's make life easier for both of them, both the drinkers and the staff that serves the drink. So what did that look like? They came up with a new business model, and they said, well, it's not only the drinkers as our customer, it's actually both the drinker and the people who serve the drinks. And through our app, we connect the two with each other. Just going to give it for free to the drinkers, right? Because they were not willing to pay for that. But the staff, they are willing to pay for it because of the ease of the app. They actually now have more time to serve the drinks, to sell more, so to increase sales, to increase the relationship. So, hey, there's some money coming in. And then I saw, well, at these bars, there's always a sort of sales system yeah, that's already in there. So if we add this app to that system, if we can connect that with each other, we can make them our customer as well, that software provider. Yeah, so they turn out to be another customer, it was another pivot that they made in their business model, it was another change in their business model. Right now, they're, they're, they're going quite okay, they're growing, they're slowly growing, and what do you think their next business model is about? What did they discover? Well, actually, it's all about data, yeah, because right now, they have the information about the drinkers, about the staff. It's connected to the sales system. So they know exactly how many beers someone drinks, how long do they stay at the bar, do they go to another bar afterwards. So they say like, hey, there's a lot of data being generated as well through this application and through the connection that we've made with the sales system. Yeah, and that will be their next move. And luckily there's someone else that trusted in that as well, so they just secured a big investment uh, in Australia, and so they're, uh, they're happy to go now. So, what is it that we learn from this? Well, one of the learnings that I see is, it's not about the app, right? It's about the problem you are solving. It's been repeated a lot of times, but that really is true. Uh, the other learning is, really understand the meaning of the data. Yeah, what, does, what does that data tell you? What can you actually do with that? Yeah, so really, really understand that. And the other point is, the single solution does not exist. Yeah, don't try to fixate yourself on a single solution. Be a designer, be a real designer, not just for your product, but also for your business. Yeah, try to design different business solutions that might help your app, yeah, the problem that you're trying to solve, to really bring it alive. So the question that I have for you today, and I also will join you this weekend, is uh, how many pivots in your business will you make, right? A lot, I hear. That's great. Uh, so uh, I hope with that we can stop the blah, blah. We can stop writing business plans and uh, make a lot of pivots uh, so that you can all be, uh, be very successful. Thank you.
everyone. Um, my name is Elizabeth Cottle, and I am the East Coast Regional Director for Girls Who Code. Um, so a little bit different than what we just heard. Oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, so a little bit uh, different from what we just heard is I do a lot of storytelling uh, for nonprofit. Um, for those of you who don't know, I see that we have some fans in the room, um, but Girls Who Code is a national nonprofit organization that works with young women in order to inspire them and give them the tools they need to pursue careers in technology. And so how we do this is we run um, in what we call summer immersion programs, which are seven week long intensives for high school girls to be embedded in a technology company and to come out at the end of those seven weeks as a proficient coder. We also run after school clubs where girls meet with uh, girls, other girls in their community at their school and they learn how to code um, in a more relaxed atmosphere about two hours a week. And so storytelling, you might not think that that would be a big part of my role, you know, running programs, but it's incredibly important. Um, I go around, talk with students and families funders, our corporate partners every single day. And basically, in my work every day, I'm telling our story. And what's really important and what I think you guys should keep in mind in building your app is that you really need to target your message to the audience. So for example, when I'm going and speaking with students um, or the general public who might not know about computer science or might not know about the gender gap in the technology sector, I really need to focus on personal anecdotes, really talk about the students, what they're getting out of the program, and also what it's like to work in computer science, to work at a technology industry. But then, if I'm going to one of our funders and pitching Girls Who Code, they know what it's like to, you know, be in the technology industry. They know firsthand what it's like um, to have that gender gap in their industry. So when I'm speaking with them about Girls Who Code and trying to get them involved in our movement, I really focus on the data, which we've been talking about. You know, talking about what the girls are doing and achieving in our classrooms, giving them hard numbers about how many girls we have inspired to major or minor in computer science, talking about you know, salaries and things like that, giving them the hard facts to show that their data, or that their dollars are going to improving real results. So one of the things that I do and that as an organization we really try to do is to encourage our girls, the girls that are part of our movement, to be able to tell their own stories. So um, we have a video that was actually just released this week, which I think is a great example of how we tell our story. I joined Girls Who Code because I wanted to be able to create things that people could use and interact with. I've always been fascinated with technology. Only 12% of programmers are women, and I wanted to try to help raise that amount. They teach three levels at the same time, so all the girls can come and they can learn based on where they're at. Coding isn't necessarily easy, but it's not scary either. I was like, wow, programming isn't really that hard or scary. I'm teaching them concepts, and they start writing their code, and they look up at you and they go, it worked. I've actually made my own game and even some arts using coding. It's taught me a lot about computer language and how things are made and created. I've only been at this for a few months, so I'm not the most amazing coder you've ever met, but I want to help create concepts and structures. We teach the fundamentals of computer science, and they use those fundamentals to do things like create a video game or generative art or artificial intelligence. Girls of Code has really boosted my self-confidence and self-esteem. We were able to tackle something that seemed really difficult and quite complex. I actually got a really good grade in our school's web design class because I understood more about what coding is. I'm kind of the loner, how you would say at the table where you don't talk to many people. I get to interact with others even though I'm usually shy. Teamwork, of course, is everything. I've made a lot of new friends. Go away, Helen! <laughs> like me! I can just be myself. We 
We take them on field trips. We arrange speakers. We went to Rent the Runway. Adobe and Twitter, where we got to go around different buildings and actually see the work environment. Honestly, it's one of the most um, fascinating companies I've ever seen. And by the year 2020, there'll be 1.4 million jobs in computer science, and only 3%, 3% will be held by women. I walk into a computer science class at Ridgefield High School and there's not a single girl sitting in that room. Now I could see that there are more girls who are into coding and not just me. I think that girl empowerment is a really important thing. Over 2,000 girls participate in Girls Who Code clubs across the country. Anyone with a passion for educating the next generation of women to learn computer science can apply to host a Girls Who Code club in a library, school, community center, really anywhere with access to computers. I really urge anyone to apply to volunteer with Girls Who Code. Apply to teach, apply to host. Join the movement. As you can see, um, we really try to empower our girls and our volunteers to tell their stories because it's such a crucial part and really the center of what we do at Girls Who Code. Hi guys, my name is Florence Noel and I'm a oh. proud member of the Girls Who Code team. It's one of our now if you're watching videos. this video, you're likely a girl interested in applying to <laughs> our summer immersion program. So I want to take this time. We can just watch all of our videos. Um, I'm in this video. <laughs> but as you can see, we really try to empower our girls to tell their own stories because we're trying to empower them to go into the technology sector. And just as we heard, you know, it's equally important, you know, to have those technical skills, but you need to be able to communicate them with the wider world in order to get customers, in order to um, you know, work with your coworkers in the technology industry. So that's something that we're really trying to work on in Girls Who Code as well. And it really helps that they are fantastic speakers and help spread our message as well. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I, so my name's Kate Stone, um, and I'm from a company in the UK called Nobelia. And I love paper and print and making paper interactive. Um, I tell stories a lot about my work. It seems to be a big part of what I do, like nearly every week. I'm somewhere telling a story. Um, but I think everyone here today has told such amazing stories. Um, I'm not really, I'm not actually, t I'm, normally when I speak, I never quite know what I'm going to say. I usually make it up as I go along. Um, um, so maybe I should talk a little bit about what I think about storytelling, hopefully just very briefly. Um, I think if you do what is expected of you, or if you do what you think people expect of you, then you're never going to surprise anybody at all. And I think if you have an idea of something that has any use or any value, then it's quite likely, well, it's more likely, that that's something that no one has ever seen before or has ever done before. And something that I've learned a lot and I'm starting to see more and more in almost everything in my life is that nearly everything that I see and nearly everything that I know turns out to be the opposite to what I see and to be the opposite to what I know, which is kind of quite strange. Um, so if you have an idea that you're going to go and tell someone that is literally going to turn their world upside down, you can't tell them in an instant. What you have to do is you have to identify with that person, um, share some common experiences, and you have to think about how can you take this person on a journey from where they are, from where they feel safe, and where they think that they know everything about what they know to a point through a story where they have a moment where you're just about to deliver this amazing nugget of information that will totally change their life. But if you tell them the story in the right way, they will realize just before you tell them exactly what you're about to say. And I think that actually can be a perfect story that the, this person who you think you're never going to be able to convince to turn their whole world upside down, that they have that aha moment just before 
you tell them. So I guess that's kind of like my perspective on storytelling. And I think also um, what I'm learning is that really kind of like the tree that falls in the woods and if no one's there, no one hears it, did it really fall? I think almost there are only stories. If you tell someone something in a moment that could be transformative for them, but they can't understand and they can't relate, they're not going to have heard what you've said and they're not going to be equipped with a story to relate that onto somebody else. And storytelling is something that we have done for tens, if not hundreds of thousands of years. And so many stories that we know and so many fairy tales that we know are what hunter-gatherers used to use as a means to package really, really important information within a story that people would pass on for generation and for generation. Um, yeah, so I guess that's kind of my perspective on, on storytelling. Um, one thing, so what I do and what I try to tell people about, I guess, is our world is centered around our smart devices, I think. And we kind of see that this is, this is our future and that we kind of expect to, to see a future that looks like the Jetsons or maybe looks like Minority Report. <laughs> and what I try and tell people is that I believe the future will look more like the past than the present that I don't believe that we will have a future that's filled with visible technology in our face absolutely everywhere. What I want to see is a future that looks more like Harry Potter and looks more like Mary Poppins. Um, <laughs> um, and I see, uh, because we're really nostalgic about beautiful old fashioned things that we love, like books and like paper, um, and technology seems to be destroying or changing so much of what we love and people are declaring those things dead. Books, paper, physical music, the high street, all of these things are declared as dead. So I tried to tell people that maybe there's a future that's not centered around these devices that we all have, like I've brought my computer onto the stage with me. Um, and that maybe it's technology that's going to disappear and not books and not all those beautiful things. And that our future is going to be filled with just beautiful, old fashioned, magical objects that just so happen to have technology embedded within in a really intuitive and simple way and in ways that, that gather data. So I make some of those things and I'm going to try and show some of them. And in some moments they've been working and in some moments they've not, so I'm not exactly quite sure what to expect. Um, yeah, yeah. Anna White. So yeah, so this is a, um, a poster of a drum kit and in my world a poster of a drum kit would actually work. Let me just put it behind. Let's put it just on the back there. I can't actually play drums, that's like the best that I can do. Um, and, but basically what I'm doing is I'm using technology and things that have been around for a long time. So I'm just using regular print, printing conductive ink onto the reverse of that piece of paper, taking a chip on a circuit board, sticking it on the back and writing some code for running capacitive touch. Basically it's the processor from an Apple II stuck on a piece of paper with some code that kind of like is what's on the iPhone for making touch, but putting that on pieces of paper and taking things that have been around for a long time and bringing them together. It's not really about technology. It's actually just about creating experiences, immersive experiences. And that's what I love. I'm a, I'm a technologist, but I love creating experiences for people. Um, I'll try and demo something else. Horribly wrong. <laughs> yeah. I rebooted my computer. I need to find a piano. Bear with me. <laughs> Um, and notebooks are supposed to play notes, at least that's what I thought. So it's a regular notebook, but I kind of hacked it to turn it into a piano that's now not working. But it did work for a second. <laughs> oh, that's a shame. 
Hang on. <laughs> Bluetooth. And I can't play piano either, but <laughs> I mean, the idea is you can play piano. <laughs> well, <laughs> um, this is DJ Qbert's album cover. Um, he's probably one of the best scratch DJs in the world. And the graphics were designed by some people here in New York called Morning Breath. And it's this beautiful double vinyl. But I made this piece of paper that goes inside that is actually working DJ decks. So, yeah, the idea is, again, it's not quite working. Oh, anyway, we can play with it all afterwards. Um, um, on this piece of paper, it Bluetooths to my computer, and you can scratch, and you can crossfade, and you can do all sorts of sound effects with it. And so, yeah, that's kind of like what I create, I guess. Um, it's just. <laughs> but uh, when anyone asks me what I do and I say I make paper interactive, they just like glaze over. I have absolutely no idea what I'm talking about. So I kind of like usually have to tell stories um, and, and I have to show things. And so, yeah, so for me, I believe that the future is going to look more like the past than the present. And we're kind of like, we're not going to some scary, shiny future full of screens. We're kind of like going home to a place where everybody knows who everybody else is. Everybody knows things about other people in a good way and we can use that information. And that everything around us will just gently and intuitively have technology in us. And it's not about technology. It's all about human experience and creating fun, immersive and interactive human experiences. Thank you. I have a feeling we're going to have some questions for this crowd, so we can take a few questions. First hand up. Yes. Uh, but can we do the microphone? Or do we have, oh, we're, it's running over. Katie, come on down. Right here. Back with everyone. Um, I'm going to be here this afternoon. Yeah. Oh, okay, but you yeah. won't you won't be here for the hackathon. Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> oh, please. Oh, please, please stay. <laughs> okay. So we have one right here, Katie. Right. I'm Katie. Hi. Um, I was just wondering for, for all three of you, um, because you, oh my God, um, what is your inspiration, not just for making the coolest poster ever, um, but in uh, working with Girls Who Code and working with helping entrepreneurs, what brought you to where you are? Yeah, I, um, it's a long journey. Um, like, like, my journey is, I, I'll try and say really briefly, um, I was a kid who used to pull apart my siblings' toys, um, and they still haven't forgiven me. Um, and I used to hack and try and make my bedroom interactive a long, long time ago, um, filled it full of wires. I totally failed at school. Um, and I think as a reward, my parents bought me a one-way ticket to Australia. <laughs> um, and I used to work on a farm for a few years out in the middle of the desert with like a scrap heap challenge type thing going on where if you couldn't solve problems, you could die. And I always used to have to say yes, that I could do things that I never knew how to do, like ride a motorbike. Never ridden a motorbike in my life, um, I guess. So it's been a journey of when someone asks me if I can do something, the answer is yes on the outside, and it's no on the inside. <laughs> um, but I got obsessed with learning, and I ended up fighting my way back into school and university, and I did exceptionally well, and I now have a PhD in physics from Cambridge, which is probably yeah, one of the best places in the world to study that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess it's just about believing in yourself Phoenix. and following your dreams. That's uh, yay for the PhD from Cambridge. Woo! <laughs> he asked as well, eh, what, is the, uh, uh, what is the fun working with entrepreneurs, eh, with girls who code? Um, and what I see is so I work both with startups and with large international organizations. There's a big difference between the two, right? I believe both can learn from each other a lot. So that's, uh, that's for me the fun uh, being in there. But what I like best when working with startups, working with entrepreneurs, it's the true passion, 
right? It's the true passion that I see in there, uh, not to make a lot of money or so per se, but to, to, to really crack the code, right? To really solve the issue, to really solve the problem and, and to spend 24-7 uh, working on that one. That, that's an inside passion that I sometimes miss with larger organizations, but I always see that with, uh, with entrepreneurs and, and that's what I like. And especially if we can, if I can help them, uh, we're indeed looking at it as well from a business perspective. I mean, it's not about making money, but it's at least about covering your cost. That's what I always say. Yeah, that's the, usually the minimal thing you need to do. And uh, if I can help them to think that way so that we can really co-create together and uh, not defining a solution, but really co-create, I think that's, uh, that's key. So for me, my inspiration every day are the girls that we work with. Um, you know, when I go and speak at a lot of schools, talk with um, a lot of girls that are in the classroom, and for the girls that are lucky that have computer science at their schools, they're usually the only girl in the, you know, if it's AP computer science, they're usually the only girl in that room. And so I want to let them know that there's a whole community of, you know, other young women that have, the, that, have that interest. Um, so that's really inspiring for me. And I also, you know, I think computer science is so fun, it's so creative, um, it's such an interesting career path that I feel like, I feel that I have a personal mission, you know, beyond, you know, Girls Who Code, where I work, um, to bring this to girls all over the world. So, um, you know, in my, per, in my professional career, I've always worked for um, nonprofits, and so I've always found that having that mission behind the work I do is really inspirational and really motivates me to do the best work that I can. Question over here. A question for Kate. Um, you mentioned that you weren't great in. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay. okay, okay. <laughs> you mentioned that you you did you weren't successful at school at first. Um, what did what attributed to that? Was it your lack of um, you didn't have an interest at first? I guess um, I guess like most people, I didn't really know who I was and what I wanted to do. I had no idea, and I was being told by other people who I should be and, and what I should do. Um, and there was just a massive, for me, a massive disconnect between I just felt different, that I wanted to be something different, but it just didn't match with what people were telling me and what I thought my path was going to be. Um, when I was in Australia and when I was working on farms and factories and things, um, and I had you know, failed my high school, had no degree or anything, um, people would come along on their gap year, um, um, who I thought they were idiots. <laughs> and I, and I, I was like, these people are going to be my boss. Like, I'm going to spend my life working in, in this warehouse or on this farm. And like, I know I have something inside. And I know that I have ideas inside. And I don't know what that is. Um, but without an education, um, I felt it was going to be very difficult for me to find my confidence to have this certificate to say, look, you know, I can actually do something. I am worth something. So, I mean, unfortunately for me, that meant going to school to university for like seven years to get to the point to give me that confidence, to give me that confidence on a piece of paper that was, that was, that was no more than the confidence I could have had from the, from the very, very beginning. Um, I guess what, so, you know, I had to go on this journey to kind of get me this, this piece of paper, but really, I had what it took inside, um, and all I needed to do right from the very beginning was believe in myself um, and just follow my, my own path. But sometimes we have to travel you know, all the way around the world to find out who we really are and to find out what we knew when we very first set off. Yeah. <laughs> Good story, thank you. <laughs> so, oh, Katie, thank you. Didn't see you in there, Heidi. Uh, hi, I have a question for Elizabeth. Um, so I just want to say um, I'm an engineer and um, my brother, he's also an engineer, but at in high school my brother was already hacking things while I grew up um, where my parents were telling me that I shouldn't study technical things because I wouldn't, like I, I'm not interested in it. So for me it was a big overhead to actually study technical things. Um, and I'm a volunteer in a robotics club in a Bronx uh, science and mathematics school. 
Um, and there's like only boys there. And when an actually a girl is accidentally in the room, she would like sneak out scared when we ask her to join us. So how do I like approach the girls? They don't even go there and I don't know how to advertise the club and how to tell them to join the club and not, yeah, just go over the overhead of, yeah. Yeah, well, first of all, congratulations on, you know, the path that you're here and thank you so much for leading this robotics club and, you know, showing even, you know, the girls see you in the room, they know that there are other women that are interested in technology. Um, you know, this is something that, you know, is something that our team talks about every single day. Um, it is very hard. You're working against, um, you know, decades of kind of institutionalized sexism in the tech industry. Um, so it's an uphill battle. Um, but what I find is really emphasizing creativity problems, or um, that you're solving real world problems, and also teamwork really attracts girls to computer science, robotics, things like that. Um, I find that frequently, if you ask a young girl what they think computer science is, they'll say something um, along the lines of like, um, you know, the movie The Social Network. It's like a lot of dorky boys who like don't shower and like program by themselves in the basement. But it's really not what it is at all, and I'm sure that hasn't been your experience. Um, so really trying to emphasize that it's fun, that it's social, um, that you're, again, solving real world problems. And it's easier if you try to get a group of girls together. You know, that's one of the reasons why Girls Who Code is a single sex organization is because um, we can create these bonds and create that community. So if you can get two girls or three girls to join or even just come and try it out, um, I'm sure it'll get them hooked. <laughs> Another question over here. Go ahead. Yeah. So me personally, I find I'm a disorganized person, and so when you, this is a question for anyone, when you found that you have a problem or you have something that you want to challenge, how do you go about making a plan of like, uh, I need to do this or I need to do this? Like, what's your, like, I don't know, time organizing strategies to overcome that? So, so for your for your business, you mean, right? So, so if you have this plan or this uh, this solution that you created, or an idea, or the idea yeah. that you have, we see typically between two and three months. Uh, like if you if you have the whole path of of developing, okay, I have this idea. Indeed, it was all about ideation, eh? indeed, coming up with different solutions, pivoting. So, what are the different solutions that you actually have uh, around that idea? And, and what's been said earlier, get out of the building and, and, and start to test, right? Start to really test with the minimum viable product and, and really get together. But after a month or three or so, you should, you should have a good feeling on which direction uh, you really should go. I want to jump in for that one because sometimes it's teaming. And we've talked about this. Um, maybe I've talked to the different tables about this. But if you have an idea and you're looking for a way to implement it, sometimes it's finding others who's like, okay, I, I want something purple, then you need someone who has purple that you can, now I want something square, to, so you need to go find the square people that can come. So it's really looking at, I don't need to solve this myself, but I have this inkling of something I think might be interesting, so I've just gotta find the right people who can help me, like add more arms and legs and another brain or two. So I think there's a, path when you know what you're doing, the product market, but the idea to more than idea. Um, you know, we talk about innovation. It, there are a lot of people that have great ideas, but it's innovation when you make it happen. So the inventors, the, they're the ones who actually go in and break things and pour stuff in the wrong place and things kind of blow up a little bit and you hope you're okay with it. But in the end, with the frazzled hair and all that, you still walk out with this, look what I made. So that's, the, you know, there's a huge gap between the idea and that's what this collaborative community, you know, we're all here to help you. So we, that's why we're here. We want to give you, if you don't know where to go with something, we're all here to say, you know what, I don't either, but maybe so-and-so does. So there's a lot of kind of broker, idea brokerage is you just find people that will go, I don't know, but I know a lot of people put it out there. So I don't know if that answers it, but 
yeah. And I think also to yeah. add to that is, I mean, uh, don't try to go to sort of a final solution immediately, yeah? because sometimes that's what you see happening. People immediately want to have like this big thing all of a sudden, but you only have this little idea and, and that needs to develop. So really take those baby steps, right? And then after a month or after two months, you look back and like, wow, you know, look at the progress I made without actually realizing it. And so, so just take the baby steps. It's way more important to do something than to come up with the big thing immediately. Yeah, just start doing it. That will, uh, that will help you. So we have come to the, I know we had one more question. We're going to, this afternoon, maybe we'll have a place where we like all those questions you didn't get to ask this morning. You know, we'll see if we can, because we're more flexible in the afternoon. We have Sandy Carter here from IBM. Thank you, panel. This was awesome.